go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much that you are our Father, and we just give you all the praise for what you have done in history and what you are going to do in the future. And I just thank you that we live in this time, Lord, that you put us here in this time, that we can see how prophecy has been fulfilled and how you are still going to work in Israel, that you still love Israel and you're still working in Israel and mm -hmm. you have a future for Israel and you've let us know that in your word. And I just thank you so much for your word and for letting us know that, letting us know what kind of God you are, what kind of man Daniel was. It's just an awesome thing to be able to study this. And we just thank you for it. And I pray that we will be faithful to your word and we will give you glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah. Everybody good? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Daniel 9. Daniel 9 is, it includes a prayer and it includes an answer. This prayer mm -hmm. is a prayer regarding the 70 years, he first, Daniel's prayer is about the 70 years, which we're going to talk about. But he doesn't realize that the answer regarding is going to be 70 weeks of years. That's going to be the answer to Daniel's prayer. It's a prayer for restoration. The answer is the answer of ultimate restoration, the Messiah. So the chapter is divided into two parts, the prayer and its answer. There was, I don't know that some of you, when we talk about prayer, one, um, some of you know who D.L. Moody is. Mm -hmm. Well, he had a five-year-old son. He was, a, he was an evangelist, had a five-year-old son that had come into Mr. Moody's study. And his father was there, very busy with his books and his Bible. He was writing and didn't want to be disturbed. And the little fella come and stood right beside him and didn't say a word, not a sound. And finally, the distraction was more than Mr. Moody could bear. And he said, well, what do you want? <laughs> the kid says, nothing, Daddy. I just wanted to be where you are. And mm -hmm. I think that's what prayer is. Prayer and first and foremost, it isn't necessarily that you want anything, but that you just want to be where God is. And so I thought that was a pretty interesting take mm. on prayer. Prayer is entering into the presence of God. It's a companionship with God. It's, it's desiring to identify with the person of God, his plans, his power, his, just his purpose. And so we don't want to miss this prayer. It's a pattern of prayer for us. Um. <clears throat> So since this is the first year of Darius, verse one, the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, um, it really takes us back to chapter six, um, the lion's den. This is the same time as the lion's den. Mm -hmm. So the prayer life of Daniel here could have been connected um, with him praying in Daniel six when he shouldn't have been praying but he was praying anyway. And it could be that this was what he was praying about. This was heavily on his mind. This answer to his prayer was probably on his mind when he was in the lion's den. And I believe that even losing his life in the lion's den didn't even matter to Daniel because he knew what God was going to do with Israel. He knew what God was going to do with Jerusalem. He knew that the Messiah was coming and he had peace. And it was all because he studied God's word and he trusted the God of God's word. And I believe that that's what gave Daniel peace in the lion's den. Um, just me throwing that in there. But the timing is all <laughs> the same. And that's how we have peace when we go through very difficult times. We know what God says. We know that God is sovereign. We know that he's powerful. And all because we have spent time in his word and spent time in prayer. And when bad things happen, hallelujah anyway, mm -hmm. right? I love mm -hmm. that song on Z88, hallelujah anyway. Okay, so verse one, Darius here is probably, like we've talked about, it's probably another name for Cyrus. 
but it tells us that Darius was a son of Ahasuerus. There are so many kings in the Media Persian uh, time that took the name of Ahasuerus. So it was a common name. So we really don't have any idea who that was. But um, it was probably um, Cyrus the Persian, even though it says a Median descent who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. Because Cyrus was the the bigger, more powerful king than the king of the Medes, Cyrus also took the title of being the king or even okay. a descendant of the media Stop person. It. Okay. So um, we still think that Stop this it. may be Cyrus. Stop it. So um, Stop. he was king over the realm of the Chaldeans. It says Chaldeans, but that is the ancient Babylon. Okay. Anytime you see Chaldeans, that is Babylon. Okay. So the dates of this man, the dates of this king, was from 536 to 539, around the time Hello. that he was about 80 years old. Okay, so at Daniel 9 here, Daniel is 80 years old or older. Hello. Now, when he came into the land, he came as a teenager, right? He was probably mm -hmm. 14, 15 years old. So this would be, he's in captivity around 65 or 67 years at this point. So even though Daniel's 80, he's been in captivity this long, 65, 67 years, something like that. <clears throat> now, verse two, in the first year of his reign, Darius, I, Daniel, this is in the first person, Daniel's writing, I observed in the books the number of the years, which was revealed as the, as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem namely 70 years. So here he says, he says the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet. This tells us that it is Jeremiah is God inspired. It is God talking to Jeremiah and Jeremiah writing it down. It's, um, <clears throat> so, um, I did read this in the commentary and I really liked it. It um, it said, while the canon of scripture is clo closed, that means there's no more books of the Bible being written, it's closed. God still speaks clearly in his word, the Bible. It's, he says, what other book can you read where the creator of the universe is speaking to you? What other book can you read where the author himself indwells you and teaches you and enables you to understand and then gives you the power to comply? Mm -hmm. Why are we not on our knees daily allowing him to speak to our wayward heart? The amazing truth is that he is the almighty creator, even yearns for an intimate personal relationship with his creation. We take our Bibles for granted leaving them on the shelf, prayer is the same way. Use prayer to take advantage of the beautiful gift of coming before the very throne of the Lord of hosts. So I thought that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, definitely. All right. So the 70 years here, let's look at um, Jeremiah 25, 11. <laughs> This is where we understand. This is probably where Daniel was reading about the 70 years. And when it dawned on him, oh, my goodness, the 70 years is just about up. Jeremiah 25, 11 through 12. The, this entire land will be a place of ruins and an object of horror. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Then it will be when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares the Lord, for their wrongdoing and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it an everlasting desolation. The number of years, okay? So it says the number of years. Um, there is, um, this is not a 
symbolism. This is not spiritualizing something. It is years, number of years. It's a plain sense. Now, in seminary, we had a saying. When the plain sense of what God is, is saying makes good sense, we seek no other sense. Least our interpretation end up being nonsense. Okay? okay. So what that's saying is that if it makes sense, if it says 70 years, we believe 70 years. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to spiritualize it or make it something else. Make it 70 days, 70 decades, 70 whatever. If it makes sense, seek no other sense. Okay, so first we un must understand God's ordinance of the Sabbath year, which he specified in Leviticus 25. Leviticus 25, verse 2 through 6. <clears throat> Okay, he says, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land, which I'm going to give you, then the land shall have a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years, you shall sow your field and for six years, you shall prune your vineyard and gather its produce. But during the seventh year, the land will have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field nor prune your vineyard. You shall not reap your harvest after growth and you shall not gather your grapes of untrimmed vines and the land will, shall have a sabbatical year. All of you shall have the Sabbath produce of the land as food for yourself, your male and female slaves, your hired worker and sovereign and foreign resident, those who live as strangers among you. So here, what he's saying is that when you come into the land, this was Leviticus. So they haven't come into Canaan yet. They haven't um, conquered anyone yet. He's telling them, when you do get the land, here, there are some rules. And one of them is that you can plow your fields six years in a row. But your seventh year, you need to let it stay fallow. You need to not plant it. That's actually a very ag good agricultural practice, actually. Um, a lot of farmers would rotate their crops or rotate their fields and not plant it and let it rest. They did. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Um, so they were to they were to do that, not plant the seventh year, just like man was supposed to rest that seventh day. God likes the number seven, by the way. Just like man was supposed to rest on the Sabbath day, your land was supposed to rest on the seventh year. You are not supposed to um grow crops in that year at all. Now what happens if they did? Let's go to Leviticus 26. First, you know what? I don't I did not put this one on here, so I'll just read it. Verse 20 Leviticus 26, 14 through 15. It's later on in that chapter, I think. No, next chapter. Yeah. Um, the next chapter. Leviticus 26, 14 through 15. He says, if you do not obey me and you do not carry out all these commandments, if instead you reject my commandments and your soul loathes my ordinances. That's an interesting way to say it. If your soul loathes my ordinances, if you don't like doing what God says, you hate his commandments. You hate his law. So as not to carry out all my commandments, but rather break my covenant in turn, Will do. I will do this to you. I will summon a sudden terror among you. Consumption and fever will make the eyes fail and soul languish. Also, you will sow your seed uselessly for your enemies will eat it. And I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated before your enemies. And those who hate you will rule over you and you will flee when no one is pursuing you. If also after these things you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sin. I will also break down your pride of power and I will make your sky like iron, your earth like bronze, your strength will be consumed uselessly for your land will not yield its produce and the trees of the land will not yield their fruit. God tells them what's going to happen if you don't obey. You would think that they would want to obey. After you would that. think so. You would think, oh, that doesn't sound very comfortable. Okay, Leviticus 26. 
33 through 36. He says, you, however, I will scatter among the nations. I will draw out a sword after you as your land becomes desolate and your cities become ruins. Then the land will restore its Sabbaths all the days of the desolation while you are in your enemy's land. Then the land will rest and restore its Sabbaths all mm -hmm. the days of its desolation. It will have the rest which it did not have on your Sabbaths while you were living on it. Okay. So you know what God says? I'm going to get my Sabbaths one way or another. You don't mm -hmm. give it to me. I'm going to take it. Okay. Second Chronicles 36 verse 20. Now, second Chronicles was written after they had already, probably after they were already permitted to go back into the land after the captivity. But here's what second Chronicles 36. 20 through 21 says he which is Nebuchadnezzar took into exiles those who had escaped from the sword to Babylon and they were servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia okay so we can see that this is a record of history Babylon took their their the exiles made them servants until Persia came so the writer of Chronicles already knew about Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths all the days of its desolation. It kept the Sabbath until 70 years were complete. So here we also see that the writer of Chronicles knew what Jeremiah was talking about. The 70 years were, were complete. Okay. So we discover that in the old Testament, the Jews did not let the land have its Sabbath for 70 Sabbaths. Um, so God said, okay, you want to play that way? Uh, then I'll um, let the land have its rest without your permission. So he kicked him out of the land for 70 years. So that's where the 70 year figure comes from. It's seven. I have on your handout, 70 Sabbaths would be 70 times seven years, or that's 490 years. OK, so for 490 years, they did not let the land rest on the seventh year. So God takes one Sabbath from each of those 470 years or 70 years, and that's where you get the 70. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. OK, so our question is, when did the 490 years start? No one knows, really, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but what they, what we believe is that we believe that it the 70 years started at the first captivity, which was 606 B.C., okay? The first captivity, there were three captivities, okay? So we believe that the first, the 70 years began at 606. And then you, if you add 490 years to, because BC is going backwards to that, you get B, 1196 BC. Now, 1196 BC was before Saul, before the king. Some people say it started around Saul, but it actually was before Saul. Saul was about um, 1100 to 1000 BC. So 1196 BC. That actually is in the time of the judges. Yeah. Now, if you read the book of Judges, it says over and over and over again that they did what was right in their own eyes. That's a phrase. If you mark that mm -hmm. phrase, you will see it repeated over and over again. So they did what was right in their own eyes, which probably meant, eh, I really don't care that God wants a Sabbath year. We really want, we're wasting that seventh year. We need to be planting something. And so it very well could be it was time that and the book of Judges is very quickly after they entered the land. So they probably almost never did the Sabbath year on their land. But anyway, the 70 years um, starts at 606 at the first um, deportation of Jehoiakim. And it goes to 536 
which is the decree of where Cyrus says, I'm going to let my exiles go back into the land. So 606, 536, that's 70 years. Okay. So Daniel knew that this was about to happen. The captivities were about to be let go. He knew that from prophecy. And this is what prompts his prayer. He's studying God's word. And this is what prompts Daniel's prayer. Okay, so that's the 70 years. Anybody have any questions on the 70 years? Okay, so now we're going to study this prayer that Daniel prays. It's awesome. When I read this prayer, I'm just, I was like, wow, this is a great prayer. Okay, verse 3 of Daniel 9. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and pleading with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Okay, and then we he goes on into his prayer. So first of all, we see humility, confession, reverence. There's all proper attitude of prayer. Now, according to the Talmud, every Jewish man recited prayer and what they would say is lord i thank god that i am not a gentile a woman or a slave mm. that was their prayer I'm like wow that's not very humble <laughs> <laughs> that's not very humble that's not confessing your sins that's saying i thank you that god that you made me so great that i'm not a Gentile, I'm not a woman, which they considered a low status, or a slave. They put women, Gentiles, and slave all in the same category. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go look. Jesus has a good example of prayer. Let's look at um, Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 9 through 14. So now... He also told this parable of some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Sounds like the Pharisees and their prayers and viewed others with contempt like Gentile women or a slave. Two men went up to, to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other tax collector. The Pharisee stood and began praying this in regard to himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I'm not a swindler, crooked, adulterer, or even like this tax collector over here. Twi I fast twice a week. I pray tithes of all that I get. So that was the prayer of the Pharisees. He's telling God how great he is. That's what he's doing. Yeah. There's no confession. There's no humility. There's no praising God. They're just saying they're praising themselves. So verse 13, but the tax collector standing some distance away was even unwilling to raise his eyes toward heaven, but was beating his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He says, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other one for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So the attitude of prayer needs to be humility. It needs to be um, not telling God how great you are. Um, but it's telling God how great he is and what a sinner we are. So we're going to look at that as we look at our pattern of prayer. So the burden of Daniel's prayer was his own sinfulness, God's greatness, his awesome majesty. So we're going to look at, I gave you on your handout, eight things that I got from John MacArthur's study Bible that characterize prayer. It characterizes this prayer of Daniel. And it should be a pattern for us to use um, when we pray. Um, the first thing is a response to God's word. We saw that in verse two. He was looking in Jeremiah. It's a response to God's word. <clears throat> verse 
we know why we ought to pray, but we find out God's purposes in his word, not because God needs our prayers to do it, but because we need to line up ourselves with God's causes, with his purpose. Prayer is for us. It's for us. It's to line up our hearts with his causes. We see our sinfulness when we come to the throne of God. Um, we see that we, we need grace and we need power and we need to submit ourselves to his plan. So prayer and the word are inseparable. I don't think we can properly pray unless we understand God's word. Because there are some things God doesn't answer. There are some things God, um, we shouldn't be praying for. Okay. So John MacArthur says the word generates prayer. When we study God's word, we see, we see God speaking. Um, when it speaks of God, we want to commune with God. We want to know God. When it speaks about blessings, we want to praise God for what he's done. Uh, when it speaks of promise, we want to we want to long for those promises. When it speaks of sin, we want to confess our sin. So when it speaks for about hell, we want to pray for those who are lost. Mm. For study of God's word generates or should motivate us to prayer. And just because we know something's inevitable, um, like Daniel, he knew the 70 years is up. That didn't mean that he didn't just say, oh, well, 70 years is up. I don't need to pray anymore. I know we're going to we're going to be leaving soon. But he prayed. We shouldn't pray with a fatalistic view. We need to pray even when we know what God is doing. We need to still pray. pray. So Daniel's prayer was born out of his study of God's word. The greater your knowledge of God, the more overwhelmed you become of your sinfulness. Um, these are trying times. We tend to forget the battle on all fronts that we're fighting these days. Churches are constantly under attack. They're criticized for teaching God's word and not we're not entertaining enough. Christians are under attack for believing that there is a right and a wrong. Families are attacked that don't allow your children to choose their own gender. The Bible's under attack for being a book of fables or just kind of nice sayings, book of history, you know. Um, we are under attack. And we need to be praying more, praying that we will be strong and know God's word. So I did hear the other day, someone um, had called himself an unencumbered Christian. I've never heard that term before, but I now know what that means. Because he said he believed the Bible, but he did not let the Bible change what he wants to do. Hmm. He was not going to let the Bible change him or what he wanted to do in his life. That's an mm -hmm. unencumbered Christian. Well, God says that's not a Christian. Mm -hmm. Right. That's yeah. a person who wants to check the box. And when you when you go somewhere and they say, what's your religion? <laughs> I was going to say, it sounds almost like a cardinal Christian to me. <laughs> well, I believe it's not a Christian. Now, I can't judge yeah. his heart, but if yeah. he says, he believes the Bible, but he doesn't let the Bible, what, you know, God says. We have many battles and it's easy for people to sit in church all and figure well all as well. We live in a very materialistic society. Things go well for us. We can go get food wherever we want. We can, we have AC, we have cars. You know, we, you know, things are going well. There's no need to pray. Mm -hmm. um, and that's more really a fatalistic view. We're, we're like, there's no uh, need to pray. Now, we pray that people get healed from their illness or cancer. But our first priority should be when we pray for people is that God saves them first. Mm -hmm. That God saves them first. Okay. Yes. And we kind of miss this um, fervency of a prayer that Daniel has, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So um, even though Daniel had this prophecy right in front of him, 
it it caused him to pray. So the word of God all a lot of times causes us to pray. And we we need to know who God is and what he's doing so that we can pray accurately. Okay, the second thing, grounded in God's will. Now, um, 1 John 5, 14 says that this is the confidence that we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Prayer is lining you up with God's will. So clearly to pray according to God's will means you also need to know God's word. Because there's a lot in the Bible that tells us what God's will is. Sometimes we say, well, I don't know what God's will is. Well, we do know some things that God says is his will in the Bible. Okay, so we do need to pray according to his will. Now you say, well, I don't know what his will is. Well, that's where Romans 8, 26 comes in. Romans 8, 26 and 27. Now in the same way, the spirit also helps our weakness for we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words or some versions say cannot be uttered. Okay. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the promise here is that if we don't know how we ought to pray, the spirit of God will intercede for us that, and it's not in a, um, a baby talk that we talk to God and that God knows what we're saying. It is the spirit of God knows what our hearts knows our burdens and knows how to pray for us. Sometimes we don't know how to pray. Sometimes we just come to the Lord and say, I don't know how to pray in this situation. It, we also will find out next week, that the angel Gabriel interrupted, almost interrupted Daniel's prayer. God sent the angel to answer Daniel's prayer before he even finished praying because he knew what Daniel was going to pray. So sometimes we may not know how, what is God's will. And we'll talk about that in a little bit about God's will. Um, okay. So even though we don't know what God's will is, the spirit, according to Romans 8, will intercede for us. Okay. Now, we don't always know what God's will is in every situation. But if you study God's word, we know in some cases what God's will is. We know that it's God's will that people be saved. Right there, right. Hey, so we can always pray that God, that people be saved. That's mm -hmm. God's will. Okay, now I know mm -hmm. that it's according to Ephesians 5, that God's will is that we be set apart under the spirit of God, filled with the spirit. It is God's will that we be filled with the spirit. Okay, okay so me. if you are a Christian, you have the spirit of God. There is no second baptism of the spirit. If you are a Christian, the moment you became Christian, you have the spirit of God in you. That's mm -hmm. called the new covenant. Okay. It's also God's will, 1 Thessalonians 4 says that we are to, it is God's will that you abstain from sexual immorality. That's God's will for you. It specifically says that's God's will. And in Romans 13, it says God's will is that you submit to the government. That is God's will. You don't have to ask God about what you should do in that situation. You should submit to the government. Okay. Now, first of uh, Thessalonians 5 says, I know that God's will is that everything we give thanks. Give thanks in everything, for that is God's will for you. Okay. And we also know, according to 1 Peter 3, that God's will is that you suffer. Don't really like that one. God says you're going to suffer for, well, for, for being a Christian. That's going to be God's will for us. Okay, so we know a lot of things that are God's will. And the um, spirit of God intercedes us, intercedes for us if we don't know what God's will in an unutterable way, not in ecstatic speech, but uh, words that can't be said. 
It's a divine communication between God and the Father and the Spirit. Okay? Because he makes intercessions for the saints. So, um, Now, Augustine, um, Augustine lived around two and three hundred A.D. We use a lot of his writings, but he says, "Love God and do what you want." My mom just gave me a dirty look. <laughs> <laughs> love God and do what you want. So, what does that mean? If you yeah. love God, we already said the verse. If you love me, what? You obey, you obey, 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 obey my, my commandments. commandments. So if you love God, you're going to That's obey right, his amen. commandments. Okay. So then the things that aren't outlined in the word of God is what God's will is and isn't outlined in what is sin in, in scripture. Then do what you want. So we say, well, I don't know if I should take this job. I don't know what God's will is if I should take this job. Well, are you loving God and obeying his commandments? Are you uh, being thankful? Are you abstaining from sexual immorality? Do you have sin in your life you need to confess? If, if, if you're working on all those things, you just want to know how, how to live out this, what is God's will? Well, take the job and see where it leads you. If you feel like this is what you want to do and God will either open doors or he will close doors. And that's how, you know, what God's will is. We thought my husband and I thought we were wanted to be missionaries to Romania when we first got saved and we were working toward that goal and God closed doors. He closed them, flat out closed them. And we're so glad he did because if we had just dropped everything and said, God wants us to go to Romania, we don't care what it, what it costs or what, you know, what happens. We're just going to trust God. But God says, don't leap off a cliff and think that he's going to save you. Give us okay. discernment. All right. You have discernment. You, mm -hmm. you move cautiously and, and wisely. And when he op opens doors, walk in them. If he closes them, then that's not for you. Right. And we know now that if we had gone to Romania, we would have been home within a year. Mm -hmm. And so we wait for doors to be open. Mm -hmm. You can do what you want, but God sometimes will close doors. Mm -hmm. it's a good and so that's what, that's how we know God's will. If you can't decide whether you buy a red car or a blue car, buy whatever you want. It's not in the Bible. And if he closes the door on the red car, then it's not God's will for you to have the red car. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Well>, that works. <laughs> so that's how we know what God's will is. Okay. Okay. Any questions on one and two so far? Or comments? Good. Okay. Good. All right. Number three. It's characterized by fervency. And we see in verse three, he gave his attention to the Lord, seeked him by prayer, pleading, and fasting, acts for. He is deep in prayer. Now we we uh, call what's called arrow prayers. It's just arrow prayers that we shoot up throughout the day, and those are good. Those are good. But sometimes we just need to pray intensely to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I think we've gotten away from this praying intensely. Prayer cannot always be just a passing thing. It's a setting your heart towards something. It's not repetitious. We used to say. God is good. God is great. Let him thank him for our food every time we ate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Repetition of even the Lord's prayer. The Lord's prayer was not there for us to memorize and repeat it without understanding what it means. Without just really uh, praying it. But that's not the only prayer. We shouldn't just use the Lord's prayer. Um, as well, that's my prayer. No, you need that's to commune prayer. and have an understanding and feeling about those words. And that's a good study too, to study the mm -hmm. Lord's prayer. Mm -hmm. It's a really good study. Um, but anyway, it's prayer is not to be something that we just repeat. We memorize and repeat. It is a communication 
with a God. And it is a lot of times my most fervent prayers are done between Christmas and Titusville. I turn yep. off the radio. It's a 20 to 30 minute drive. And that's where I get a lot of my praying done. <laughs> okay. You can do that. Pray in the line at the bank. Pray in the line. You know, use your time wisely. A lot of times when you're mowing the yard. <laughs> mowing the yard. Oh my goodness. John's on my husband is on the tractor. He said that he prays just about all day. He's on the tractor, not thinking about a lot of stuff. So he just spends a lot of it in prayer. And he needs to, because that's a dangerous place out in the woods where he is in the tractor. So anyway, it we need to have more of a fervency in our prayers, like Daniel did. Okay, now verse now um number four says it is realized in, in self-denial. Um self-denial is really the awareness that you don't even belong in the presence of God to begin with. I mean, you don't even belong in the presence of God. You have you don't have one thing in and of yourself to commend yourself to God. Daniel knew he didn't belong in the presence of God, especially he if he was to drag some sin in there. And so uh, in contrast to the Pharisees prayer, I thank God I'm not like other men. I do all this. I fast. I give tithes. God didn't even hear that prayer. So he so Daniel is dealing with that matter. He pleads with God for a deeper repentance, a horror of sin. Okay. Okay. The fifth point, true intercessory prayer is identified with God's people. So we if you did a lot of your uh, markings of of Daniel 9, you will see where Daniel says over and over again, us, we, our, you know, he identifies himself with the nation of Israel. That, um, So Paul even said he prays for all the saints. Our focus of our prayers is to be on others. When it's focused on us, we need to say, look, I'm a sinner. I don't even belong here. You know, but to pray for others, you realize, first of all, that you don't belong here, that the word of God has called you to be there and you seek God's will and you set your own will aside and you pour out your heart on behalf of others. And that's what Daniel did. That's what Paul did a lot of times. OK, number six, strengthened by confession. Hey, okay, Daniel knew that he was a sinner, too. And this whole prayer is really a confession. He says, uh, when God is at work in a life, repentance and confession becomes the norm. The closer you get to the Lord, the more a sinner you realize that you are. Okay. The more you study God's word and see the standard of holiness. In, in chapter 7 of Romans, Paul understood that about the law of God. He says, I didn't even know I was a sinner until I read the law of God and the, and God's law showed me what a sinner I was. And he says, I just, it slew me. It slew me. It, I, it made me realize that I could never come to even close to the holiness of God, to the perfection of God. Right. And what are we saying really was, you know, like when you're going down a road and you're, and you don't know what the speed limit is, and you're just going what you think is comfortable. And then all of a sudden you see a speed limit sign and you realize, oh my goodness, I am speeding. I am breaking the law. <laughs> that is like all of a sudden, oh, there's a law and I've broken it. And and Paul says, I and now that I see the law, I see the holiness of God and I see the sinfulness of me. And so a confession's a daily part of a godly man or woman's life. It was a part of Daniel's prayer. Okay. And because in verse 13, if we look at verse 13, um, he says, just as it, it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us 
Yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord, our God, by turning from our wrongdoing and giving attention to your truth. Uh, they had warning with the law of God and they didn't listen. And so God, God had every right to do what he did. Then verse 14 says, so the Lord has kept the disaster in store and brought it on us. We deserve it for the Lord. Our God is righteous. If you mark righteous, you will see that all through that God is righteous. He's doing the right thing with respect to all his deeds, which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. So confession here, Daniel knew that they deserve what they get and he was repenting for them. He was asking God to forgive them of their sin. Okay, number seven, true intercessory prayer is dependent on God's character. If God was like the gods of the Philistines, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Muslims, it wouldn't do a lot of good to ask for forgiveness because their gods are evil. They're cruel gods. They don't forgive. They don't love. They're dead. They're, they're dead. They're not alive like our gods. Not so with our God. We pray our prayers of forgiveness, confession, and we call on God on behalf of the people. We intercede for the needs of others because we believe God hears and responds. Amen. Amen. Because he is a God that does that based on the character of God. He will hear and he will respond. In, in verse 15, it says, And now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made a name for yourself. He's saying that God is powerful. I'm praying to a God that's powerful enough to respond. He has all the resources at his disposal. He brought us out of Egypt. It's wonderful to pray to a God who has all that power. Isn't it? Then verse 16 he says, Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts. He says this several times. Um, in Back in verse 7, he says, oh, Lord, righteousness belongs to thee. God is holy. He will do what is right, not what is wrong. We can trust that. It's wonderful to understand that. That God can never do anything wrong. He's always right. He's always right. He's always right. No matter what he does, it's right. I believe that Daniel's in the lion's den and he's saying, I'm here because God is right. I can have peace because God is working. He's doing what he wants done. And whatever he does is right. So we have to have that already in our being, in our mind, so that when we go through our life, when things happen, when bad things happen, we know that God is right. God is sovereign. He is powerful. Okay. And whatever happens to us is God is right. Okay. Verse number eight, intercessory prayer finally consummates in God's glory. Verse 17. So now our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas. And for whose sake? for your sake lord let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary so here he's saying um not for our sakes we don't deserve it we're sinful people we didn't do what we're supposed to do he says for your sake oh lord Oh, my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thy eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for your great mercies. For your great compassion. That's verse 18. We're not making claims based on our righteousness. We're saying do it that you might manifest your mercy. The city that is called by your name. Your reputation is at stake. Daniel is saying, God, vindicate your name. Don't let your name be smeared. Don't let you be spoken evil of. Don't let our sin corrupt your reputation. That's a mature prayer there. Forgive us for your sake. Sometimes I don't think we pray like that. We, we need to 
there's we need to pray lord i pray that you would save this person for your sake for your glory i pray that you would heal this person for your glory when we pray for people and they are healed we need to remind them that god did it and give amen. god glory for it amen sometimes we pray and say oh good praise the lord you were healed Mm -mm. go and point them to god's glory mm -hmm. god didn't do it just to make them well they god doesn't want you healthy yeah, wealthy and wise he wants god's glory to be manifested and so do we pray that god will do certain things in our life in our church and lives of other people so that his name would be glorified so god would be glorified that's how we should be praying yeah okay in verse John 14, 13, it says, And whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, so that the Father might be, what? Glorified. Glorified, Glorified in the Son. That's why we get answered prayers. It says God will be glorified. Hmm. So, what we learn about prayer is that prayer is what generated first by the word of God, by studying the word of God. It is grounded in the will of God. We pray according to God's will. It's characterized by fervency. It's realized in self-denial, not pride, not coming to God in pride, but self-denial. We identify with others. We have, we confess our sins. We're dependent on God's character. And we're and it is consummated in God's glory. That kind of prayer changes your relationship with God. It'll change how we view ourselves and how we view others. It will glorify God, and that's God's ultimate goal. The ultimate goal of prayer is to glorify God. Not us, not other people. And Daniel knew that. This prayer here that Daniel prays is an awesome prayer. You should read it again with these kind of things in mind. And it will help you in your prayer life. There are a lot of people who say, well, I can't pray out loud. Hmm. Well, and I understand that. Public, you know, speaking in front of other people and saying things is it's difficult. But I will tell you that the more you pray in private, it's like an iceberg. The more you pray in private underneath, when you are asked to pray in front of um, praying God's word, understanding God's word and understanding how to pray, we get it from studying God's word. And so hopefully this is something that we can practice and we can be better at and God and our relationship with God will be better for it. Mm -hmm. It will improve our relationship with God when we pray the right things. Okay. That's um, anybody have any questions? It's good. <laughs> okay. Anybody have any comments? Well, we Great pray study. <laughs> God's will, we have to be able to accept God's will. When we pray God's will be done, mm -hmm. we've got to be ready to accept his will. Okay, my mom said when we pray in God's will, we have to be ready to accept God's will. Like in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done yeah. on earth. As it is, yeah. heaven, right? We have to be willing to accept it. Whether it's yes, no, go here, do that. This person doesn't get saved. This person doesn't get healed. We have to accept that as God's, God's will. will. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Because God is always right. Yeah. He is. Yes. All right. Very good. Anybody else have something? 
I like where it talks about with Daniel, how he looked up to prayer like he was doing at the beginning, how he went to the tower. I bet you that's what he did in, in a way and mm -hmm. how he sought God and stuff. I used to feel guilty about my prayer life because I always thought, well, it's not very long, Lord, but I started praying, you know, throughout the day. And it's amazing when God puts someone on your life too to pray oh, yeah. for them. We should always be in an attitude of prayer. Mm -hmm. um, and quietness. Right. And you know what? We will never pray enough. We will never study God's word enough. <laughs> We're never going to be there. But do what you can. Do and do it um, intentionally and and uh, with the right attitude. Yes. Uh, a lot of times, praying back the characteristic of God is is an awesome thing to do. Um, praying, you know, a lot of times God's word back to Him is also a very good thing to do. But yeah, we're never going to do enough prayer and study God's word enough. Um, we, we, uh, there's a lot of distractions in life in there. Mm, yes. Have, yes. Definitely. We can't, um, study God's 20 word, 24 hours a day. We do have to do take care of some things. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So next week we are going to see Gabriel showing up while he is praying and we're going to start and talking about the 70 weeks and so next week bring your calculator because we are going to be doing a lot of math okay. <laughs> we're going to do a lot of math it's not algebra it's just math <laughs> just regular math <laughs> um there's a lot of numbers being thrown out here in daniel 9 and so we're gonna we already saw the 70 sabbaths the 490 years, okay? We're going to see another 490 years in the future. This is the answer to Daniel's prayer. And we're going to see another 490 years. So this is um, this is going to be all future. Um, and so there's a lot to talk about next week. My, Our heads are going to be just exploding with information. It's going to be awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. Uh, prophecy one of the most famous and exact and incredible prophecies in the bible really and if you understand daniel this part about the 70 weeks you will understand the book of revelation as well okay so i'm excited about next week so um your homework for next week is verses 20 through 27 and we'll see if we can get through it all next week we'll see <laughs> we don't want to rush it but if not we'll just keep on keep on keeping on okay since we're talking about prayer we're closing prayer i don't always close in prayer um uh, you know sometimes we pray out of tradition you know sometimes we think we have to pray at every meal okay that's a tradition it's a good tradition it's a good to be thankful for your food it's good but you know, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, they would not eat a bite of food until they prayed. Okay. And I, I would tell them, it's okay for you to eat without praying. It's okay. God, says give thanks. God does say give thanks, but it doesn't mean that we have to say it before we eat. We can have, we can be thankful all day. Okay. So sometimes our prayers are, are tradition. Uh, so not, I don't always pray at the end of Bible study. I will always pray before because I always want to ask God to help us in our study. But tonight, since we're praying, we're, since we're studying on prayer, we will close in prayer. Okay. That's good. So let's close in prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much for your word that um, I thank you for Daniel and that he has written down this prayer and that we can learn so much from this prayer. We thank you that you are awesome and you are righteous and that you have let us know the character of you. It, that You didn't have to let us know anything about you, but you are a gracious God and, and that you want to, um, to speak to us. 
you want to have a relationship with us. And thank you for letting us know that. And we pray that we will be faithful daughters to you and that we will give you glory in our lives and in our prayer life so that people will know that we have been with Jesus. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Pam. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. awesome. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you.